Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news and a show I called Reality Asserts Itself. And we'll be back in a second with Jane McAlevey. So this is a continuation of my series of interviews with Jane McAlevey, which focuses on the lessons and experiences that help shape her worldview and build her approach to organizing workers. Jane's the author of several books, including No Shortcuts and Raising Expectations and Raising Hell, which was named the most valuable book in 2012 by The Nation magazine. And I would suggest you, if you haven't watched the first segments of this series of interviews, go back to the beginning because it will all make a heck of a lot more sense. Uh, thanks for joining us again, Jane. My pleasure. Happy to be here. So pick us up from the uh, Highlander Center. Uh, it was a, a kind of a sounds like quite a profound experience in terms of what shaped you as an organizer. Yeah, I would say that Highlander, and I know we touched on it a little bit, sort of the key lessons I learned there. But the, the work that I went to do at the Highlander Center, I was recruited to the Highlander Center because I'd been working in Latin America. Um, I get recruited to the Highlander Center. And when I go there, I'm working jointly on a joint project with the Highlander Center and something called the National Toxics Campaign, which was one of the more important early uh, organizational formations, certainly nationally in the United States, that represented a new kind of environmental movement, which was an environmental movement led by people of color primarily and led by poor communities. And it was a real break from the tradition of sort of the white led uh, wealthy sort of conservation movement, which when I used to think about what the environmental movement was when I was young, I wasn't very you know impressed. It wasn't, I didn't feel like they were my people even though I desperately wanted to save the planet. Um, and so the work that I had been doing as a, you know, as a young person uh, was, I was winding my way in to this new formation called the National Toxics Campaign. And it came together with my move to the South because they wanted, they were interested in the time at having more of a Southeastern focus in the United States. They didn't have a strong Southeastern focus. And conveniently I had been working with them and then I'm being recruited to the Highlander Center and the Highlander Center wanted me to come there to do work on globalization like that was the job. They were like, we want you to come here and help workers in the U.S. South understand um, the problem is not that Mexicans are stealing their jobs. The problem is that CEOs and the multinational corporate elite are making you think the Mexicans are stealing your jobs when actually it's the corporations who are stealing your jobs. Right. So that my my from the Highlanders perspective, my day job was about how to get how to get workers who were being sort of victimized, right, by globalization, by the transfer of factory jobs out of the United States and into the global South. That was their biggest interest was that I helped create an educational program that would let workers on their own, not being lectured at, but on their own come to understand who was to blame for the pain in their lives. Overlapping with that, there was an emerging understanding of this thing that we now understand may better, or some of us do, which was that we were heading into a global uh, environmental catastrophe. And this is around 92, 93? This is 1991, 1992. Um, And so we already understand that there's a link between the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, the sort of historic Bretton Woods institutions, um, and how they're driving an unsustainable economic system, which is not just bad for workers across the world uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, right? The walls are down now. We're moving towards this sort of global hegemony around capitalism, though it looks different in different countries. It's not that different at the end of the day, and it isn't 30 years later, right? So, um, So we're seeing the emergence of sort of more of a hegemonic world when it comes to there's kind of one big system and China plays an interesting role, but we, 30 years later, we know how that movie is playing itself out, right? So, um, so Highlander was very focused on, can you prioritize helping workers on their own through the methods that I would learn from my mentors at Highlander? How do we create an educational system focused on letting workers see for themselves that it's the CEOs and the corporate elite that are destroying their lives? 
and not that Mexicans or Central Americans are stealing their factory jobs, right? So that was their primary motivation for me to move to the South. At the same time, there was an organization called the National Toxics Campaign, which was really the first national organization in the United States to center poor people and people who lived next to highly polluting industries and put them at the center of the organization. And what was so brilliant about the National Toxics Campaign, and again, how I wound up being in these places at the right moment in terms of my young, my, what I learned at such young ages um, is amazing to me because we were so ahead in understanding the twinned crisis of the attack on workers and the attack on the environment. And there was no separation. And we understood that back in the early 1990s and probably many communities of color, by the way, understood it for 100, 200, 300, you know, from slavery on, by the way, right? Cotton was unsustainable and slavery was vicious. Jim Crow, you know, was basically in the United States, the Jim Crow was essentially continuing slavery in the cotton fields, right? And cotton turns out to be one of the most damaging soil crops in the history of the world. And I had been working with environmentalists and trade unionists in Central America and seeing the effects of like what the pesticide use of cotton was doing to the workers and the families and to the water systems. So Latin America would bring all of this into very acute focus more quickly, I think, than we were seeing it in the United States. So then I come, to the, I come back to the United States, I go to the Highlander, and I'm working jointly for the National Toxics Campaign, as well as for the Highlander Center on what we called a joint project, um, with me based in the U.S. South, beginning to, beginning to bring the national effort into Highlanders already exploration into mostly white people in Appalachia dying from runoff in rivers from, get this, one of the pulp and paper mills, which is huge in the U.S. South, right? Georgia Pacific, one of the biggest lumber makers in the world, comes from Georgia. So people were starting to realize, I should say this because it actually matters. In 1986, in the United States, a law was passed called the Superfund uh, Law. And there was some, there was a, a law called the right to know, I don't get too technical, but, but there's a reason this happened when it happened. There was a law, there was a, an amendment to the Superfund law, which is a law that makes corporations put some pennies away in case they cause an environmental disaster. There was a law that progressive trade unionists and the progressive environmentalists fought for that passed in 1986 called the right to know law and the right to know amendments amended the National Superfund law. I'll stop on the technicalities now, but this is gonna help the story make sense historically. It took about two years for the environmental movement and the trade unions who were involved in that, in the right to know law, to operationalize the law. So it's 1988 in the United States right now. And suddenly the movement has the tools because it took two years to just implement the basics of the law. We now, as United States citizens or people, have the right to request through a very bureaucratic process, but still we have this new right to request if you live near a factory, what are the chemicals that the factory is using and how are you discharging them from the factory? So 1988 marks the beginning of Latino people and black people, especially black people, and it comes out of the faith-based community in 1988, getting their hands around the fact that what they always thought was true is actually true, which is they're being poisoned to death. Okay, so we retire Jim Crow, and now we put all the poisonous factories that pollute like crazy in black communities, but also I'm at the Highlander Center, which is nestled between white poor Appalachia and the Deep South. And so we also understand this is not about just killing black people, it's about killing poor people, right? Black people are a subset of poor people in the United States and they're a particular subset of poor people that the United States has always tried to kill. You know what I mean? It's just a brutal system. So, um, but so you merge it all together and suddenly I'm living in the South working for both of these entities. And my day job, my assignment is to help people understand how globalization is affecting this, but also, uh, connecting the environmental crisis to the economic crisis. So that really, that was my, that was sort of like my day job, as I would say. 
um, working with communities throughout the Deep South and Appalachia and going into very poor communities, for example, going into deep Alabama uh, and working on trying to shut down. And I think we discussed that because it put me very close to Bessemer where that Amazon fight just happened. But I'd spent quite a bit of time in and around parts of Alabama working with black communities who were fighting to get whole new water systems put in because chem waste management, which is the largest in the world, it's the largest corporation in the world that handles waste disposal, particularly hazardous waste. And guess where their largest chemical waste dump in the world was? N not outside of the United States, fascinatingly, right? Because the US South and black communities in the US South get treated like colonial, the way we treat, you know, parts of Africa, frankly. It's like, that's how racist and evil this corporate elite that we've been battling my whole life really is. So the largest chemical waste dump in the world sits in Alabama. Black families in the whole community are dying. The workers are dying. Their children are dying. The leukemia rate is off the charts. And we're, and we are now getting the evidence because of this law that the stuff that's coming at, that's leaking out of the, the leach fields from this waste, the largest waste up in the world is, is actually killing. Um, black people and it's actually poisoning all of their babies and mothers are having maternal major issues with their kids in the womb getting poisoned and coming out with major birth defects or dead. So, you know, we're literally talking about life and death as we are at the hands of the cops right now in the United States, but this is 1991, 1992. Um, so that was really like the work I did day in and day out was helping communities try and figure out how to build the power to fight back. And the segue to the trade union work for me um, is essentially that our best partner in the national toxics campaign was one of the most forward thinking trade union leaders I've ever met uh, rest in peace. He's no longer with us. His name was Tony Mazaki. He was the head of what was called OCA, the oil chemical and atomical workers union. It's sort of the union that was featured in uh, Silkwood, you know, kind of Hollywood yeah. movie way back in the 80s. So it's that union. Um, and that union kind of makes him a little bit famous. But so I literally meet this trade unionist who raises my expectations at such a young age that the trade union movement can once again be the movement that I'm dreaming that it can be, which is radical, forward thinking, willing to take on really hard issues, not running away from the rank and file membership about having really hard questions like, hey, guys, we seem to be dying on the job. And when you guys go home from the factory, the ones who live near the factory, your, your family seems to be getting sick and dying too. So this is a problem. And Tony Mazaki in 19, in the late 1970s, I mean, I'm still in like junior high school or something. Tony Mazaki, as I begin to do my homework on him, this brilliant trade union leader, um, calls for something that we are just, that the globe is just beginning to use the language over the last few years, which is he calls in the late 1970s for a just transition of the workers in his industries to shut their own industries down and transition those workers with guarantees to other good jobs in a clean economy. That's 1977. He writes a book, well, there's a book written in 19, that comes out in 1983 uh, and I am spacing out the name right this second. It's going to come to me. But he writes a book in, or he writes a book with this guy, Richard Grossman, in 1983 that articulates the principles of a just transition that come from the late 1970s from the leader of a forward thinking trade union who literally went to his guys and said, Look, I know this seems counterintuitive. It's mostly guys. Look, guys, I know this seems counterintuitive, but we need to call for ending our jobs because we're killing the planet and we're killing our families. That's oh, 1977. That's, that's really something. Brilliant. Tony is dead, but that shapes all of my work. And it sets an early expectation in my life that a trade union can be forward thinking and willing to take on really hard topics. We're missing Tony Mizaki right now on this planet in a really big way uh, because he was so willing to take on the big questions. But that was most of my work at Highlander. And I would continue to do that work uh, when I left the South. Uh, we're still uh, hoping to have a serious conversation about just transition. As people like Bob Poland and others have done models, it, even, it doesn't even cost that much. I mean, I can't, I can't understand, even just from the most narrow, self-interested, partisan political positioning, 
why Biden doesn't just promise fossil fuel workers a just transition and make that a major part of the campaign in West Virginia and places like that. And, and, it's, and it's barely on the horizon. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. And what's, what's, what's terribly disappointing, uh, you know, Tony Mazzocchi, uh, you know, rest in peace, rest in power, as we say, is, is, is sadly long gone. Um, and the unions that are involved in some of the most polluting industries today don't share his view at all. Um, and that's really problematic. It's really problematic. It was amazing. If you still had the Tony Mizaki around today, when someone from, let's say, the Laborers International Union, Layuna, who plays a very bad role in the United States on these questions, it would not, it would be very hard today if Tony Mizaki was still with us leading the Oil, Chemical and Atomical Workers Union. It'd be very hard for the other construction trade unions to say, we can't do this, it's not possible, blah, 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 because you'd have the guy who leads the most polluting industry workers standing up and saying, actually, not only can we, we have to, right? So he was brilliant. And yeah. If the Clinton administration had actually seriously committed to just transition in the 90s, uh, there may well have never been a Donald Trump as president. That's right. That's right. That, there is not even a question about that. That's absolutely right. Uh, and it's still true today. And we are still like running away from the solution. So, so what's interesting is I, I, I do that, that. That's like the work I was focused on all the time. And it involved bringing delegations, um, right? I was frequently taking delegations. It was like a norm for me was the best way that we realized for workers to learn, because we know it's not by getting lectured at, right? No one wants to be told anything. And the great thing about me working at the famous Highlander Center, which was, you know, a Frarian influenced uh, adult education center, popular education center, radical adult education center. You know, I learned so quickly, like you can't tell anyone anything. That's not going to work. And that's why I became an organizer, because organizers don't tell people anything. We put them in situations that help them come to their own conclusion that something's very, very wrong. And then we help them understand what it's going to take for them to win and get out of the mess that they're in. Right. And that's the difference between, you know, a lot of the stuff I critique in my books, like activists who just yell at people and hand them pamphlets and small font and, you know, try and tell someone that the thing that makes me the most, no, that's not great. There's so many things that make me crazy about sort of the activists left on a, on a bad day, like at their worst, it's like, you know, no margins, small font, you know, pamphlet. Well, I was going to say small font is, is like you say it all just with those two words. <laughs> right? It's, it's like, you know, and, the, and then telling, and then the other thing that happens all the time in the United States around election time is the following analysis, which comes from liberals, conservatives, and the left. When they say the following, it makes me want to, when they say, why do workers always vote against their self-interest? And that phrase, that like insults the intelligence of most people is like, first of all, you don't have any idea what their immediate self-interest is because you ain't never been poor. You've never been in their situation. You've never been trying to feed the family. You've, you know what I mean? All it just, it's so, and then the idea that like ordinary people who have access only to Fox News like understand what's actually happening around them is without a conversation, without a way to meet people who actually are going to have a different idea and help them and help them realize on their own, you know, that what they're hearing on Fox News maybe isn't true. Um, that doesn't happen by yelling at people or by lecturing them or by blaming them, you know, for 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 how they've been shaped until this point in their life, whatever that point is in their life. So it's like the thing I say about organizing is the very first rule of organizing is you better love ordinary people and you better respect like where they are right now because your job is not to judge them. Your job is to help them understand what the forces are arrayed against them and why they might be confused about how some things work under capitalism, right? But like, anyway, so I, I feel like at Highlander, this was just beaten into my head at a really young age in such a good way. Um, and so I spent a lot of time taking workers, black and white, Appalachia and the Deep South, right? So I would always have like white poor workers, which was making its own point, right? Like the black workers from Alabama would be like, oh, 
they're poisoning all of you up there too. We thought they only poisoned us. You know what I mean? So we would have these really poor communities from Appalachia and I would intentionally put them on a delegation with really poor black people from Alabama or fill in the blank, Mississippi, you know, toxic at what we call toxic alley in Baton Rouge, between Baton Rouge, New Orleans and Louisiana, which is one of the most toxic rivers. That strip of the Mississippi is like, don't ever dip a toe in it. But anyway, um, so we would intentionally mix these communities, bring them onto a delegation, and then I would take them to the U.S.-Mexico border. And it didn't cost a lot of money back then. You could put a bunch of people in a van and drive and get to the border, and people had never left their home community. So it seemed super interesting. And we would take van loads, sometimes a bus, sometimes we'd fly, you know, if it was a smaller delegation. But I spent a lot of my time either bringing workers from the global south into into our center at Tennessee, which is a big education center up on a hill, beautiful place to do meetings. Um, or I'd be bringing delegations from the South to the U.S.-Mexico border. I spent about a year and a half doing nonstop delegations of black and white workers from the U.S. South going to the U.S.-Mexico border so that they could meet the people who were stealing their jobs and realize that those people were getting poisoned, sick, super poor, somewhat living in slavery, you know, women getting raped by U.S. managers in it, by a U.S. manager who got to go over the border every day to be a manager in a Mexican factory and come back to his job in Arizona or Texas or wherever he lived. Right. So the, the it works so much better for us to take large numbers of workers there to see it and then let them come back. And then my job was to help them like debrief and talk about how are you going to take this back to your factory? Like, how will you take this back into your factory? How will you take this back into your community and explain what you just saw from your own eyes to your own community? Because that was going to be way better than Jane McAlevey, a young northerner with a funny accent to people in the South, trying to explain it, right? So my job was to set up the circumstances by which workers could learn on their own what was wrong. And frankly, I haven't stopped doing that in my entire adult life. Like that is what I do. I figure out, and that's what organizers do. You know, we're educators. A real organizer is an educator. We are setting up situations so that people can figure out the right lessons very quickly. And a lesson that's going to be so profound, it's going to twist their head upside down, right? Like your boss is not your friend. Um, actually, your line manager actually is connected to the guy who just knocked down, you know, your gentrified your neighborhood, right? It's like how we set up those situations so that people come to learn them on their own without being lectured to. So that that's what that's what brought me to the South, and it's also what brought me out of the South. I wound up I wound up after three years, you know, I become the deputy director at the Highlander Center because the deputy director went on um, a paternity leave. So at like age, I don't know something too young, 27, 26. I was suddenly like the deputy director of this huge institution in the South. I was one of the only white people and I was the only Northerner in the whole staff team of 28 people. Um, and I will tell you, not surprisingly, it led to a little bit of resentment for me to be the age I was in that position. I think it was probably a error of judgment <laughs> on the part of the otherwise brilliant director. Um, of the institution. But after about another year and a half of doing, I left being deputy director. I went back to being the globalization coordinator. Um, and at like 27 or so, I think now, three years at Highlander, um, I decide uh, that it's that it's actually not right for me to take like one of the rare, beautiful staff positions as a Northerner in a Southern facing institution. And that actually it should be filled by Southerners. So that was like, my, they were trying to get me to stay to become like the director for life. And I was like, you know what? This does not feel right to me. So um, I leave the South. Um, I'm gonna go back to California at that point to continue doing something similar. Um, by the way, the National Toxics Campaign in that time period blows up. Um, which is also an early lesson for me in what it means to have turf wars and political infighting and how self-destructive our own movement can be uh, to ourselves, right? That we're our own Why? Our what, what, own what happened? It's like we're our own enemy, you know, like the right wing does all these things. And I'm always like, yeah, if our side could just get it together, which is true right now of the trade unions, if we could just get it together, things would really be going dreamily right now or a lot better than they are. So... It's too long a story almost, but it suffice to say blew up around race politics. Mm. So, you know, it was like, again, early, a lot of early lessons in if you don't take race on straight up right away, early and in every conversation, you're not going to build a working class movement. 
because it's there, you know? Um, so, so all of those things happened. I decided I was going to head back um, to the West Coast at that point. And well, hang on. When, when you say take race on head on, what does that mean then? How do you do that? Well, it's going to be better to talk about it when we get when we fast forward into the trade union movement. But I mean, not run from it. But I mean, yeah, because I mean, it's just, it's my entire adult life is taking on race. I mean, there is there is no way to unify the working class until and unless in the United States, especially until and unless we take on the race question, there is no unifying the working class. Right. Like, you know, I forget who said it first, someone much smarter than me a long time ago who said, you know, race is the first division of the working class. Slavery was the first division of the working class. Du Bois, I'm, I can't remember which brilliant person said it, um, you know, during Reconstruction in the United States after the Civil War. But certainly I learned at a very young age, it was not an option to avoid hard conversations about race or you simply, or gender, by the way. But it, in the U.S. South, no way you're avoiding dealing with race questions straight up. And there was an unwillingness to do that uh, that's a short story of a very long story, but there was a persistent unwillingness to do it um, by the leadership in the National Toxics Campaign. And it led to a, a very unfortunate um, sort of huge split in the organization. Uh, so I feel like, you know, I'm still in my young 20s and now I'm learning about splits and politics and internal warfare. Uh, and that, you know, sadly, all of these things continue to be true because, you know, democracy, it turns out, it's pretty complicated, right? Small D democracy. It's actually pretty complicated. Um, and the older I get, the more I appreciate that it's pretty complicated. I also feel like it doesn't have to be as complicated as we make it, you know? So um, both things are true. Anyway, so I decide, uh, you know, I've done three years in the U.S. South, deep in the South. I've learned an incredible amount about both race and gender and, you know, uh, a different view of the United States when you live in the deep South, like it's a different part of the United States. So um, I thought, well, maybe I'll go to the Southwest. I hadn't done the Southwest yet. I always had this idea when I was young, I don't know if I said this early on, that I always knew I wanted to like, where I always dreamed that I would be able to have some kind of like, that national camp, that someday I'd be doing like national campaigns that would matter. So this is a young Jane. And I thought the way, to, the way to become someone who could understand how to run national campaigns would be to live in every corner of the U.S. Like I thought I needed to, I, th I thought I needed to understand the cultural differences in each part of the U.S. So I kind of did that. I basically set out to like live around the U.S. Um, in each significant region. Um, so I leave Highlander um, after uh, we take a huge delegation to Brazil. Um, to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. It's 1992. It was the first big UN official conference that hinted at the climate crisis to come, where we were very much understanding in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil in 1992, in this first huge international conference that the UN did, that what we were doing was not sustainable. And that literally the rate, the, you know, freshwater, there's going to be a crisis in freshwater coming. You know, um, we understood then the relationship between the destruction of tropical rainforests in huge swaths and carbon emissions, right? So it was like, but it, it was sort of new. And, and, and the climate scientists were just beginning to speak up, right? 89 is sort of the beginning of when the climate scientists begin to issue statements that no one understands because they write them like climate scientists. That's why Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben and people who come much later are so important, right? Because they can translate it. But in 1989, the first statements that were coming out saying, we're going to have a global climate crisis, um, were, were being taken up at this conference in Rio de Janeiro. So I got sent down to Brazil to do the advanced work. So I lived in Brazil for six months um, to, to bring a whole alternative delegation from around the world, not just the U.S., but I was anchoring the U.S. delegation. Um, so I was meeting with the head of the prostitutes union, which it turns out is at that time, one of the most impressive trade unions I've ever met. Like we don't have a prostitutes union in the United States, you know, it's not legal. It's looked down upon all these issues. Um, and I'm realizing like, wow, in Rio de Janeiro, how do these women have so much power? Oh, you know why? They formed a union. And so the things I learned from the most powerful prostitution union I had ever experienced, and I'm like 
27 going, wow, they don't have transmissible diseases happening in this sector because literally they've organized trade unions and they've removed like what we think of as the classic pimp. Okay, we're getting, I digress, but these were like really, like me constantly learning if workers got together and built power, they actually could have power in all sorts of industries. You know, so today when people say to me, oh, Jane, you're always talking about hospital workers and nurses and people who work in buildings together. And I'm like, yeah, you have no idea. Like, no, I'm talking about prostitutes in one of the biggest cities in the world, right? Who figured out how to like defend themselves and create good jobs. Like, you know, amazing. So anyway, Brazil. And I remember introducing the trade union leaders and environmental organizers from the U.S. when we took the delegation to meet the prostitutes union. It was a special moment when people realized, well, Huh. These <laughs> women have built some really serious power by forming a trade union. Anyway, so that's my sort of transition out um, of Highlander. I do one more big delegation on the U.S. border. Now I think it's 1993, and we're doing a big, it was called a tri-national conference, Canadians. Can so I begin to do work with Canadians, Canadians, U.S. people. It's like understanding NAFTA. So it's pre-NAFTA. And we're on the road to the North American Free Trade Agreement. And people are like, wait, there's this person, McAlevey, who's made all these connections on the U.S.-Mexico border. Let's get her involved. So now I'm like, it's like my first kind of consulting gig. I've left Highlander. National Toxic Campaign is no more. I'm driving slowly back to California, thinking I'm going to move back to California. I get waylaid on the U.S.-Mexico border to do this conference. Um, and it's a faith-based conference. So now faith comes in and the role of faith. And it's going to be sponsored by faith leaders, which is, you know, a realization that I already knew from working and living in the South, like faith leaders have a particular set of moralities, which allow them to speak differently than other people. So it's going to be a faith based conference on the crisis on the U.S. Mexico border uh, with Canadians, um, U.S. folks and Mexicans. And it's because Clinton's now in and they're describing and discussing NAFTA right? What becomes NAFTA. And the people I'm working with are like, are you effing kidding me? Like we were fighting this thing like crazy. We're, you know, at the High, even at the Highlander Center, we were like, what is this North American Free Trade Agreement? Oh, they're going to take the maquiladoras that we've been taking all these workers to visit where people are dying and they're going to make that the global model. This is not going to be good, you know, for Canadians. Yeah. For, for people who don't know these maquiladoras were these uh, tax-free zones that corporations could come down and supposedly uh, develop some industry in northern Mexico. But I was there, too. I mean, you, the sewage is running open in the streets. Kids are playing in the sewage. And I also had an experience on the border. You described uh, in the same period, early 90s. I, I went to Tijuana and then I went to the border at sundown. And uh, I, this is people getting ready to cross the border into the United States. I was on the Mexican side. And there's about 200 people to my left, 200 people to my right, uh, people selling popcorn and tacos. It was like a party. I think somebody was playing music. And they're all ready for the sun to go down in order to get across the border. And waiting for them on the other side was nobody because it was harvest time. And of course, California agribusiness wanted them to come over. And then once they're there, they retreated like slaves. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, the agribusiness. Anyway, yeah, it's just amazing the, the endless exploitation uh, that goes on of the earth and of the people on it. And by the way, all sorts of species. But yeah, it just, you know, it's like, anyway, so that those, those were all, I mean, these were all years when I was not, you know, I was not yet full time in the trade union movement. But the, the series of learnings that I'm getting, you know, are setting me up for and it's short, you know, we're getting close to the trade union movement. But by the time I come into the trade union movement in 1996, um, I've I've already been working with some of the best trade unionists in the United States because they were not running. They were not running from the climate crisis. They were actually trying to understand it. Um, I was working with some of the best community based organizations in the United States, you know, working on trying to clean up poisons and toxic and hazardous waste. Um, and we had to build coalitions with workers right in the facilities because we understood that if we called for the plant to be closed down with no alternative, no one was going to, people couldn't call for a plant to be closed down. That didn't make any sense to them, right? That was their job. So I was put in this position at such a young age um, to grapple with 
the factory job I have, which is paying me very well, is also killing me and my parents and my kids when I go home. And, you know, being forced to contend with, it wasn't so simple as just saying, close the factory down and then spending the rest of my, you know, and I basically, we're going to fast forward, but it's like, I, I leave the environmental movement because after another few years of just listening to one national environmental group after another, you know, calling for plants to close with no just transition, no economic strategy, no way to take care of the livelihood of the workers. I was like, I'm out of here. I am done with these people. I could not spend one more minute working with national environmental organizations who were not dealing with race and racism and who were not dealing with the practical experience of workers whose lives depended on jobs that were very bad. Um, and that's essentially the end of that phase of my life and my move uh, into the trade union um, movement where I decide I got to get to the place where there's a working class organization where workers pay for their own organizations through dues, not through charity or foundation or rich people giving them money um, and try and figure out how the hell we're going to save this planet because it's not going to be the environmental movement. Yeah, I mean, the environmental movement was completely and to a large extent still is delusional, delusional. if they think there's going to be effective climate policy without a workers movement. Exactly. They're out of their minds. So. Exactly. And, all right, we'll pick that up in the next segment. Thanks very much, Jane. My pleasure. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining me on Reality Asserts Itself on the analysis.news. And don't forget the donate button and the subscribe button and the share button, all the buttons. <laughs>